So thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, share some thoughts with you today. It is a great honor to be at this institution of excellence, to be amongst you and to share some thoughts on how we could potentially address one of the most vexing problems and, and challenges that the world faces. And what I'll try and do is, is attempt to do this in about 30 minutes or so and share with you a very personal perspective on what the issues are, where are we going, and how can particularly young people contribute in this quest to bring some justice in the world. Uh, I'll try and cover as best as I can in the next uh, 30 minutes or so uh, the issues that relate to the global burden, um, the burden as it relates to the Millennium Development Goals, particularly those that relate to maternal and child health. We talk a little bit about what are the major issues within that context that determine adverse outcome and mortality in particular. I'll spend a little bit of time on what we know about interventions that work and spend a considerable amount of time sharing with you some really exciting emerging innovations that are beginning to change the landscape. And this is important in terms of underscoring not only how difficult this area is, but how hopeful we are for change. And then finally, I will pose the question, how is it that you and I can contribute in making this world a better place to live in? So ladies and gentlemen, many of you know about the Millennium Goals. These were coined by heads of states in tandem with many technocrats in looking at how could the world dramatically change outcomes in relation to health and determinants over a time trajectory of about 20 years. So they look at targets that are specifically set on reduction of poverty, reduction on some of the determinants that lead to poverty, and specific health issues. And of the ones that I am keen on sharing some thoughts with you today are the ones that relate to child mortality and maternal mortality. So the goals were set to look at around a two-thirds to three-quarters reduction in child and maternal mortality from 1990 benchmarks by the year 2015. So today, as we stand towards the latter end of 2011, we are just four years away from realizing whether or not we'll achieve those targets. A lot of the Millennium Goals are around numbers, quantification, measurement. And it's important as we look at them to recognize that numbers can be very misleading. In fact, in Einstein's words, not everything that can be counted counts. And I would like you to remember this because a lot of the focus within the goals are largely on achieving certain benchmarks and not necessarily on how we achieve that. And do the averages translate to equitable progress for everybody concerned? But be that as it may, the numbers do tell us something. And one of the things that we do know is that despite all the difficulties, tremendous progress has been made in reducing child mortality and even maternal mortality globally. So this map looks at how we have been able to reduce the probability of dying in much of the developing world from figures of 1970 and 80, when we were dealing with close to around 15 million child deaths, to the current figures of around 8 million child deaths. But these figures, you know, although summarized in millions, are huge. So if you look at real numbers, we are looking at close to 350,000 women dying during childbirth or in relation to pregnancy every year, and close to around 8 million children under 5 who die annually. These numbers are huge. And they hide behind them a lot of disparities, as I will mention shortly. If you look at the distribution of these deaths, and you look at many parts of the world where most of the mortality is clustered, it's all around Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, countries which have the highest rates of maternal death. And not surprisingly, if you were to look at the distribution of child mortality, 
it is the same countries which also carry the highest burden of under five mortality. And this point deserves emphasis because the health of the mother and the child is very closely intertwined. And it is especially intertwined in relation to newborn outcomes. So if you look at which countries have or have not made progress in relation to newborn mortality, you will find that those numbers tell you something. So let's look at the top 10 countries which account for close to around three quarters of all newborn deaths. And you see them all up here. Many of these are in Africa, but a reasonable number are in Asia, in the part of the world that I live and work in. Now, if you were to turn these figures around and say what proportion of maternal deaths occur in those countries, you will see that they account also for two thirds of all maternal deaths. And not surprisingly, what we've recently recognized is they also account for almost two-thirds of all stillbirths, something that we don't talk about because these are not babies born alive, they're born dead, and therefore they don't get counted. So this close link between maternal, fetal, newborn, and child outcomes is particularly notable in the context of the Millennium Goals. So in this very recent publication on time trends in neonatal mortality by, by colleagues from WHO and others, you will see very clearly that if you look at the last 20 years or so and see which countries have made progress in newborn mortality, you will see clearly that where we currently have a large proportion of clustering of maternal and child deaths, these are the countries where progress in terms of reducing newborn deaths has been minimal. And one can therefore imagine that without addressing newborn mortality, these countries will not be able to achieve the Millennium Gold targets for reducing child mortality. And that is exactly the case. So this is our summary analysis from the countdown process, looking at which countries are on track to reducing maternal and child mortality by 2015. And the point that I want to drive home is that if you want to see the composite of those countries which are not on track to reduce child mortality as well as maternal mortality, those are 48 out of the 64 countdown countries, roughly 71%. So we are already in 2011 reasonably certain that a large number of these countries will miss the millennium targets and therefore we need to look at a trajectory for change that is beyond 2015. What is it that kills? women and children. Now, if you look at the causes of newborn deaths that I've spent some time on, just three disorders, prematurities, infections, birth asphyxia, account for close to around 81% of all newborn deaths. And if we were to look at the corresponding disorders in women that cause maternal mortality, these four conditions of hemorrhage, hypertension, preeclampsia, infections, and obstructive labor account for about 60% of all maternal deaths. And these disorders also account for a reasonable amount of neonatal morbidity and mortality. So the links between maternal and newborn deaths is also strengthened by our understanding of what those deaths are due to. And some of these issues can be prevented clearly by addressing this unaddressed burden of maternal morbidity. Beyond the newborn period, we still lose a large number of children from disorders that we should not be losing them from in 2011. One of those, as Dr. Zipersky mentioned, is a subject of my work during my sabbatical period is to address the 1.25 million deaths that still take place due to childhood diarrhea, and also the persistent burden of childhood pneumonia that kills another 20% of all children. So we know what we are dealing with. We know our foes. We also know the numbers and the distribution, the challenges in going beyond the numbers. So these facts will tell you many things, but they won't tell you much about the underlying determinants. So it's important to go behind the causes and to look at what the underlying factors are. 
And one of those factors that we typically do not talk about in technical fora are poverty. And when we do talk about poverty, we talk about poverty in the simplistic definition of money and purchasing power. Whereas poverty is much more than this. Poverty also has dimensions that I will mention shortly that relate to things like empowerment, things like hope, and things like access, which may or may not be related to things like socioeconomic gradients. So let me illustrate that by one example. These are data from a project area where my group does a lot of its work in rural Pakistan. And these are some years ago when we evaluated a consecutive 50 families that had lost a newborn baby where despite the offer of care and the offer of services, they had not taken the child to a facility. And when we went back and asked them as to the reasons why, some of the reasons were very clear. That in about 37%, the issues had to do with the health system. The health system wasn't functioning. The physician wasn't very receptive. Quality of care, or the physician was absent, or the nurse wasn't there. Things that we quite readily recognize. In a smaller proportion, the issue was money. There just wasn't enough money to go to a facility. But in a large number of cases, which I seem to have skipped over, the issue was to do with empowerment, with the woman not being able to go back to a facility because the father was not at home, or the grandfather did not give permission, or there wasn't a male member at home. Those issues have very little to do with poverty per se, but they have to do with another kind of poverty that actually is something that Mother Teresa mentioned in her work. And what Mother Teresa said is that we sometimes think of poverty as only being hungry, naked, and homeless, with the poverty of being unwanted and unloved and uncared for is probably much greater. And she was absolutely right, because in my daily work, in many parts of my own country, this is the kind of poverty that we don't have solutions for, at least within the, the World Bank doctrines of social adjustments and, and cash transfers. Let me illustrate that by one more example. So these are data from the Demographic Health Survey done in Pakistan on looking at the gradients for coverage of indicators between the poorest and the richest quintiles of the population. This is a national survey that we analyzed. So there are some things that you would expect. So within the poorest, the proportion of pregnancies that were protected against tetanus or born in facilities that relate to services significantly lower than amongst the rich. But I want you to see something else. I want you to see things that don't necessarily require money, such as whether or not the husband and wife had even discussed the place of birth. That amongst the poorest, only about 25% had even discussed this. In three quarters, this was a fait accompli. It was something that never cross their mind that would be an option because it was just given that that would not take place. So that's the kind of hopelessness or what I call poverty of, of hope that one has to overcome in many of these societies. <laughs> 